In 1918, the Diplomatic Courier Service was established to support the work of American diplomats by ensuring that classified messages and materials were delivered safely and securely to U.S. embassies and consulates around the world. Over the hundred-year history of the Courier Service, this mission, critical to the national security of the United States, has not changed. In the 1950s, before the onset of the Jet Age, this small group of couriers traveled tens of thousands of miles per year, often spending months on the road. Following World War II, as tensions between former allies grew into the Cold War and the Soviets consolidated power on their western border, it became increasingly difficult to reach our posts behind what became known as the Iron Curtain. Because of a continued mutual respect for international conventions on diplomatic relations, even during these complicated times, diplomatic couriers were among the few still able to travel across these borders. Each week, they took the Orient Express from Vienna to reach Budapest and Bucharest. Oh, the Orient Express. <laughs> uh, that was, uh, of course, a, a fabled uh, train ride. We never got to ride it all the way to Constantinople or Istanbul, but we would pick it up in Vienna and ride it in from Vienna to Budapest to Bucharest. Then we'd turn around and come back out. Sometimes inside Europe, we'd take train travel because it was more uh, effective and then quicker than trying to take an airplane, especially when we were providing service to the Iron Curtain countries, which required two couriers to, to be on a trip for security reasons. We were carrying classified material. Top secret wasn't always something that was written. In those days before the technology we have today, we had to have code machines equipment that was highly classified. Outside of the Iron Curtain, you traveled solo. For example, when you're delivering the pouches to Southeast Asia or Africa or South America, the, the courier went out on trips solo. However, trips to the Iron Curtain, we were always in pairs so that there was no possibility that the couriers would be unable to have control of their pouches. I think I've got the history right. The reason we make paired trips behind the curtain goes back to uh, the immediate post-war. An American courier fell off the train and he was killed and his pouch disappeared for a while. And there was, uh, I think, a little suspicion that this was not an accident. Henceforth, uh, the Americans decided it would be a paired trip. And I think the British did the same. You had to have somebody with the pauses at all times. We'd get out and walk up and down the aisle in the wagon lane, but that was as far as we ventured. On the same sleeping cars, there were other couriers from other nations, Italian, French, Russians. When they were outside of Russia, they traveled paired, just like we did behind the Iron Curtain. That's one of the things about the Russians. They wanted the same treatment in the West that we were given behind the Iron Curtain, which was decent for the most part. Your job was to, uh, to take care of those uh, pouches. I don't think we ever felt uh, that somebody was threatening us going trying to steal them, but we always have to assume that. In fact, I remember Jim Vanderveer and I got off the train with our pouches. It was quite a load. We pulled over one of these baggage carts. It was already half loaded, the porter said, and there were Russian pouches on that. There were two Russian curries. So here were the four of us. He's got the pouches watching our own bags. There was only one baggage cart. We tried to get a separate one, but they said no. And that, that was it. I thought, how ironic of the, the four of us in this situation. We were stationed in Vienna. There were two of us then. Monday, we would go into Budapest and spend the night and then the next day on to uh, Bucharest. Vienna itself was a lot of fun. 
and so was Budapest, except for the uh, brief hiatus in Bucharest, uh, which was dull as dishwater. <laughs> the rest of it was uh, was fun. We used the Alberg Orient Express, which came out of Paris, but we picked it up in Vienna. It, it's just a delightful city. It showed the grandeur that it had you know, as part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, even though it was somewhat damaged from the, the rubble of the war. The Austrians, one of the first things they thought was important to rebuild was the Opera House. And now to see the change, the transformation, the rebuilding that was going on there. Loved going to the opera. Of course, the Danube is not blue. It's only in the eyes of a poet and a, a composer. I attended my first and only opera sung in German, which I did not understand, and as a result, never went to another opera in my life. <laughs> we did a lot of eating and a lot of sightseeing. All of us did, because it was a fantastic city. I repeated that in a detail several times thereafter in later years. It was always enjoyable to me because we got out of the air for a while. It was restful on those trains. All we did was sleep, eat, and uh, play chess or uh, pinochle or something like that. The courier would come down from Frankfurt every week or twice a week to give us the stuff to take in. Then we'd go shop to get our food to take on the train. Made sure we had enough wine or scotch and uh, reading material, cards, etc. And he'd leave at night from the West Bahnhof in Vienna. He made one stop, I guess it's called the North Bahnhof, and then into the border, which is the Austrian side, is Nickelsdorf. And it would stay there for some long time. So even though Vienna is not that far from Budapest, it was an overnight trip. The train, the Orient Express, would set up a single sleeper car for the diplomatic couriers. That would be the British, the Queen's Messenger, King's Messenger, the Italians, whoever, any, any courier from any nation that was making a trip and that it would be on that train. The other people in the uh, sleeping compartments, they were all uh, di diplomatic couriers from various countries. They were Italians and there were the British and there were the French also because the air travel was not possible, particularly during the winter months there. We usually dressed rather casually at that point, and uh, the Italians would uh, dress in uh, their silk pajamas or a silk robe and so on. The English, which were the Queen's messengers, they were great uh, storytellers, raconteurs, and had fantastic tales to tell. The Queen's Messenger was usually a very senior officer, uh, army officer, military officer, or sometimes civil servant. They traveled in pairs also, but their junior courier was usually a retired policeman. So there was a very distinct difference in rank. So when the Queen's Messenger had his dinner, the number two courier would lay out a white tablecloth in his compartment and proceed to to serve him is me. <laughs> we got a kick out of that. The primary car for us was the old Wagon Leeds Cook. They handled all these sleeping cars. Their first class car was practically all couriers. There was a dining car next to it, but the food was awful. We had to cook our own food, so we all carried a little alcohol stove, would sit up in the sleeping compartment and cook in that. The ride in would leave early in the evening and we would have dinner while we were on the train. We had developed a uh, international <laughs> society of couriers and we'd set it up in advance so that the couriers from this country would bring in an entree, the couriers from the other country would bring in the salad, who'd bring in the dessert, who'd bring in the wine and what have you. 
and we just merely leave notes so that next week couriers, we, we didn't know who they'd be, but you, you get into Vienna and say, hey, it's this week, I would say, well, if Ken and I were on a trip, we got the note at the, the embassy, we were supposed to provide the wine. We knew there'd be X number of couriers on board, and we'd bring that much on. Coming out was totally different. The train left Bucharest near midnight, so everybody was sacked in, and it was dawn by the time you arrived in Vienna. We slept in one compartment on that portion of the trip. Then it would cross into Hungary, and that town was called Egerschelem. After they stopped there for a long time, we go into Budapest and arrive there in the morning. We would get off the train and have a full 24 hour period in Budapest where we could shop, look around. And the parliament building there was magnificent, especially from across the river where you could see it so plainly. It, it was an interesting city. We're still showing more damage. The bridge across the Danube River was destroyed. It was laying there in the river itself. But you see, it had a, a glamour to it yet, and it was trying to restore that. And uh, it was an exciting and interesting city with a, a bit of the schmaltz that you had in Vienna, Austria, too, with evening dinners that were excellent and uh, violin music to go with it. We'd have a layover sometime a day or so in uh, in Budapest, which was fun. It was still a, a lively city, and it was before uh, the revolution. Budapest itself, I love the city. A lot of people consider it the Paris of Eastern Europe. It still had some damage, though, from World War II, actually. And then after the revolution, of course, it uh, uh, really uh, got uh, torn apart. In spite of communism and all the restrictions they imposed on their society, they were really fun-loving people. I remember going to a nightclub and seeing the people dancing and having a ball, and they thought, this can't be everywhere else. It's usually so drab, like Moscow itself. And to see those people enjoying themselves and having fun, and they were well, fun people. <laughs> Hungary was the, the nicest place in the uh, Iron Curtain for couriers. Even though you were always under surveillance by the local KGB, they were called Evos or Avos in, in Hungary. They were less intrusive than they were in Moscow. We spent the whole day and, and the night at the Hotel Duna, which was really a nice hotel right on the Danube. They had a nice restaurant, a little nice bar. And there was a guy there that we used to refer to as Abo Joe. And he would always befriend the couriers, and we were sure that he was being paid by the Abo to just to keep an eye on the couriers. But we all sort of liked the guy. He was helpful, a funny old guy. And he enjoyed walking around Budapest, even though it was still pretty well shot because of the revolution. In fact, they did more damage, I think, during that time than they did during the war. What I always understood was that the Russian troops didn't want to fight against the Hungarians, and the ABO were tougher on the Hungarian citizens than the Russian soldiers. The revolution started right in front of the Hotel Duna, and the two couriers were stuck in there for about a week. They were Woody Vest and Phil Olivares. We got off at the station, we went to the Duna Hotel. The Duna is the word for the Danube, of course. It's right on the river. It was quite a hotel. It's an old-fashioned hotel with the high ceilings and all that. We liked the place. And I remember Woody Vest and I, we went to see uh, the opera. They were doing Eugene on Jägen. We came back from the theater and then we got into the elevator. And we heard some noise and such about. We thought something's going on around town. I think we heard a shot or two, if I'm not mistaken. But I remember, uh, and in the elevator was the New York Times correspondent and his wife. And we said, well, we asked him, I said, 
you know what's going on? He said, oh, it seems to be a minor thing and all that. Well, <laughs> we got to, went up to our rooms the next morning, we got a call from the legation to say, stay put, you're not going any place, everything is closing down. We're in the beginning of an insurrection and that's when it's, it started and the shooting starts. And uh, we just stayed put uh, a couple of days. But there was British couriers in there as well. There was some shooting. I think I walked out to see what was going on at one point. And I walked a few feet and I heard bullets whizzing by my ear. And I said, I better get back into the hotel. And I realized it was really bad. And they even brought in a Russian soldier who had been hit by a sniper. Well, one of the Hungarian surgeons was up on the roof. The legation wanted to evacuate most of the personnel. In fact, most of the legation, the British as well. They put us in embassy cars with the dependents and we drove out of uh, Budapest. With the flags flying on the fenders like ambassadors' cars. But I remember the people applauding and clapping when they saw Americans and British uh, flags. All around them were Russians. I remember even in the, in the hotel, men behind the desk, the reception desk kept saying, where are you Americans, why don't you help us? They said, you, your voice of America tells us to, to rise up, do something about it, and now we need your help. I felt so embarrassed by all of this in a sense, why aren't we helping these people? And I felt a little guilty that we were like rats leaving the ship. They were applauding, we're not really doing anything for them, we should be doing something for them, and we should have our tanks in here, and, uh, but I know that's not something for me to decide on. But I always felt a little guilty about that going out. We're going out to safety, and these people got to be here and live with the, uh, with the Russians on, on top of them. The longest part was when they got on the train the next morning to, to Bucharest, because that was uh, overnight from the morning to the next morning. After going all through the Ploesti oil fields, Oh, you see them burning and the gas off the top. It was really something. Yeah, that was pretty close to the end of the trip because they were up still in the mountains. Not long after that, you come down into Bucharest. You get in in the morning and leave late at night. So you spend a whole day in Bucharest. For most of the time I was there, we stayed with the, the military attaché, no matter who, who he was. We would arrive in Bucharest early in the morning, six o'clock or so, something like that. And we would go to the military attaché's residence who provided us with breakfast. They couldn't get fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. We would carry oranges into them and give them oranges or bananas. The diplomatic colony there, the Western diplomatic colony, had a six-hole golf course at a, um, a club that they had, where they had a bar and uh, you could play six holes, and I did. Played six holes of golf there more than once. And uh, a place for the Western community to relax without anybody around spying on them. And I'm sure there was plenty of that behind the Iron Curtain at all times. I don't know whether I was followed, I wasn't looking for it, but we were, we were briefed beforehand, don't fraternize. Don't get caught with any women behind the Iron Curtain, period. Well, we went out a lot of times to that diplomatic golf course, especially in the good weather. We would bring cigarettes and um, razor blades and instant coffee to pay for our golf lessons. <laughs> and there was a little lake there where you could go out in a little boat to help spend the day. Of course, it wasn't that long that we left again that night. 
you have to check in and get the pouches and leave to go back. I found Bucharest a very uninteresting city. Now, they were really behind the curtain there. I can't recall having any interaction at all. For their sake and our sake, it's better not to. That was my impression. Perhaps if I were to go back today, I'd be, I'd be dead wrong. Bucharest, uh, yeah, we, we had time there too, and uh, it's a poorer country. It was a dictatorship for quite a while in Ceausescu. As we well know, the people were really dominated with the secret police, although the communist elite led a very gracious and a very luxurious lifestyle. I found it rather a poor city by contrast, even with Budapest, which still had a glory aspect to it. Going back, it was a little different. We would get some food in Bucharest, buy bread and buy this and buy that at these little outlet stores. You know, you just stand in line to buy some stuff. It was depressing in a way, for the people, I mean. As we came back on that trip, we would leave in the night from Bucharest, get in the next night in the Budapest. The train would stop in Budapest for quite a long time. You could see that red star on a foggy night mist. Not until the next morning we end up back in Vienna. We enjoy those trips. I think we all did. I still think it's a more civilized way to travel is up by train. Train stations were fascinating in those days. They had all the excitement that the airports took on. But I remember in Europe, the railroad stations themselves, they were big cavernous affairs, mostly wrought iron and such. There was an aura about them all that fascinated me. And I felt so proud to be part of all of that.